Now open the discussion panel. I'd like to encourage those of you that are practicing to share your experience that um, over the years you may have, may have seen these patients. And I also like to encourage the students come forward to ask questions as well. When you uh, come forward to ask questions, please use the microphones located um, in the center aisles. Is it on? Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. it's good. Um, so I have a question. With the advent of so many soft drinks and really poor oral hygiene conditions and sometimes met mouth and that type of thing, with there's so much prevalence of uh, problem you know, with uh, enamel and the appearance of the enamel, how can we diagnostically um, determine whether it's something that's a congenital issue on, let's say, someone who's in their 20s who first present to us, or is it something that is, has to do with their nutrition? Makes, does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the answer is a thousand dollars. I was paying attention. I, I think you have to ask a history. You, you, need, <laughs> you need information to start. If I understand you correctly, just you're, you're trying to understand why you have some, some defect, tooth defect, enamel defect. I think you have to get some history. Yes, the, uh, I found that it's amazing how many different ways you can ruin a tooth. Or, uh, and so often you have to discover some habit that is completely hidden and you have to really probe. And sometimes you might find, for instance, that a tooth that's out of position, and you'll just happen to observe the patient with their fingernail there, uh, sort of biting on it and forcing the teeth apart. And it, it's, you, I think that you hit the nail on the head when you say you need to get more information. You, you have to really uh, become a detective and, and try to solve some of these problems. The, in cases where a, a condition is inherited, uh, you'll generally see something wrong with, with most or all of the teeth, although it can be uh, localized. But you, you then have, you may have to even explore uh, what the teeth look like in other members of the family. See if this thing is something that uh, you see over and over again in different people, or at least in one other person in the family. So there isn't one uh, answer to that, but I think that in general you have to be a detective and try to get more information and uh, sometimes observe and ask a lot of questions about potential habits. I, I, I found that usually people are, in a way, stewing in, in their own juices and when I was practicing dentistry that, they, uh, that you, you find out that the, the results in their mouth are something that were caused by the way they live their life and you have to explore that and try to figure it out. Can I make one comment? Sure. One, one thing that yes, I've uh, kind of stumbled on the last <clears throat> year or so, it, it, it's always been a mystery to me, because I do a fair amount of reconstructive cases, why individuals will wear their front teeth and you see very little wear on their back teeth. You know, and you say, well, geez, why, you know, why is that? I mean, it could be habits or fractures or something. And I think the thing that I've kind of realized is many of these patients have sleep apnea. You see, and so you see someone that's worn their front teeth away <clears throat> at, a, you know, at, a, at a modestly young age and, the, and their back teeth are, you know, have minimal wear by comparison, you, know, you better start getting some sleep apnea tests on these individuals. You know, so you know, it's all about diagnosis and the more we learn, the more we can diagnose. So Bruce, I wonder whether you can elaborate a little bit more. Why would sleep Apnea. Uh, what happens is people, when they're interior. sleeping, they're Tushy. choking, and their jaw, you know, their tongue and everything is obstructing their airway, and so they posture their jaw forward. And when they posture their jaw forward, they're hitting their front teeth. Okay, thanks. For, I, you know, I, just, you know, I just, okay, sorry. Yes. Hello, my name is Amanda. I'm a senior hygiene student at U of M, and I wanted to know. You know, genetic testing is still relatively expensive for our patients. So how important is it for us as hygienists to encourage our patients that do have um, 
imperfections in their enamel and dentin, problems like that for them to get the genetic testing? Good question. Dr. Hart, would you like to take on that one? Well, I, I wouldn't refer everybody with a genetic defect necessarily for genetic testing, but um, there are particularly, you're fortunate here in a university setting in a town, you probably have a genetic counseling program here. And there are genetic testing, you know, you, you know with genetic testing as a form, you have genetic counselors, uh, master's degrees, and then you have physicians who are genetics counselors and MDs who are, who are geneticists. So if you have a condition and refer it, uh, you can have testing depending on the condition. But it, it's, I noticed what Dr. Simmer said, and I think oftentimes, they, there's a real need in genetics counseling to have dental expertise because they don't oftentimes have that particular expertise. Um, as far as referrals, you know, with, with genetic testing, people, one of the reasons people refer for genetic testing comes back to when you get a DNA result, a genetic test result, and issues before sending an informed consent issues and then explaining the result to people. And with genetic testing, people sit down. They t what's involved in a genetic consult is genetics counselor or, or physician will take a full genetic history and uh, pretty comprehensive to try and identify uh, all aspects of genetic issues in the family. But so it's much more than just say if you had an AI defect referred for that. It's usually genetic uh, counseling and testing is more involved than that. Now there is a test and it varies. I mean there are costs to test and it varies. If you had chromosomal analysis for instance which is, you know, uh, common for certain types of conditions, I think they run about a thousand dollars. Other genetic tests are, are of different costs. Um, as far as you're asking, when you would decide to, to make a genetic referral, uh, I'd, I would be guided by the scope of the, the issue, the scope of the problem. Um, you know. Yes, if, you, if you've actually checked out the pedigree and you think that there's a condition that you think is inherited, it, I mean, there's a lot of factors. First of all, is this causing a problem that the patient is concerned with? Is it is a very minimal uh, problem that they, they really are not suffering any consequences from? Then you might just advise them that they seem to have a, an inherited condition that they should probably get informa more information about and see if they could determine what that is in case there's any part of that uh, disorder that is unseen and undetected at this point. So it, it doesn't mean when you refer someone that they have to go through and have all their DNA sequenced. They can just start a conversation with someone who's more expert than the dentist and will be able to give them more information on how, further, how much further they want to go. So if you, to me, it, most people are really curious if they have some type of genetic defect is in defining out what it is. In fact, as a dentist, sometimes the, the most knowledgeable patient you'll ever have is someone with a genetic disorder. They'll come in knowing more genetics than you ever dreamed possible in a patient, and they, they're sort of going to be asking you questions to try to test your depth to see if they're in the right dental office. So generally, when I think most people that when they have uh, some type of inherited disorder, they're really interested in trying to find out more. Uh, just as a, as a last comment on that, this is a great question. I think one of the things we need to do as a field, uh, dentistry and oral medicine, is, is integrate into more of patterns of genetic referral and understanding it and working with geneticists. I think it's a real opportunity that we need to pursue for growth. Yeah. I think the point was very good. It's not just the testing itself. There has to be follow-up consultation provided to the patient. For um, the specific states that required a firm diagnosis in order to provide uh, special um, care coverage, um, it is important perhaps to pursue genetic um, diagnosis for these patients. Unfortunately, at this time, uh, genetic diagnosis for most of the AI and uh, dentinal genesis imperfecta condition is not available uh, among clinical laboratories is still uh, at research laboratory uh, level at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I have two uh, quick questions from the restorative point of view. 
So you showed recreating the cusp tips with composite on those canines and having um, reestablishing canine guidance. Do you require your patients to wear a bite splint when you do that sort of procedure? And what material did you use to opaque the tooth in office? Did you use a foldable composite? Uh, to answer your first question, sometimes. Uh, if it's just uh, early stages wear, <clears throat> usually I'll do the, I'll do the uh, cusp tips, and I don't prep it, I just kind of roughen it up a little bit uh, with a diamond, and I don't try to create any kind of retention other than just uh, adhesion, adhesive bonding. Uh, but a lot of success in dentistry is making sure, I call it making your patient part of the solution. And so I make it clear to the patient that, you know, your teeth are going to, your, your bite is going to seem kind of strange for the first few days until you, you know, redevelop some neuromuscular reflexes uh, and a new canine guidance. And, uh, you know, I, I tell them to take it really easy because if it's going to fracture, it's usually going to fracture early on. Uh, I tell them not to use their teeth as tools. You know, don't, don't grind on it. You know, it's going to feel weird, but just leave it alone and you will get used to it. Your teeth are going to seem a little longer, so aesthetically you may have some getting used to. And, and again, the psychologist's success and, and being successful is predicting problems and making sure the patient's aware of those problems, you know, before you start. Now, if someone, uh, in contrast, I, I try to do that procedure and they're constantly breaking them off no matter what I do, which I will tell you happens almost never, uh, but if, if it were happening then, uh, or they were getting more extensive problems, uh, I'd get them on some kind of uh, nocturnal appliance anyway. Uh, re regarding the, um, so I don't do it all the time necessarily. So, uh, I will say one other little thing. Sometimes when you're modifying somebody's bite that way, you might make them just a quick, like a, like a bleaching stint, you know, just to wear short term, because I don't usually use those for nighttime appliances for extended periods of time, but that can kind of maybe get you through that getting used to period. Uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the opaquers, there's a number, number of those on the market. Uh, that one right there happened to be a, a material called Kerr Color Plus. It's a resin tint kit. Uh, resin tints are just high chroma, in this case high opacity uh, flowables essentially, and you can pa paint them on. They're fairly minimal viscosity, come on all different colors, and, uh, and you can get a couple opacities. Uh, Pulp Dent makes a nice opaquing kit. Uh, Cosmodent makes a nice opaque and kin. So there's a number of those on the market. And it's just essentially a, uh, a high opacity, high chrome uh, floral composite. Could you please, uh, just for the wet fingered dentists out here, uh, give us a quick, uh, again, repeat the difference between DD and DI. Um, and then for Bruce, uh, how do you keep the opaquer from squirting out around the margins? Well, I'll answer mine first. These are all opaquers. <laughs> how do you keep the opaquer from squirting around the margins? It's very simple. I cure the composite before I uh, cement the restoration in. Okay, so the technique goes something like this. Obviously, you have some space because most labs will use dye spacers under your restorations. So you have 25... 50 microns of space. That might be enough. Uh, in this particular case here, I took a, uh, I think a, a two round burr. A two round burr will give you about two tenths of a millimeter of reduction. It's easy to control. You put a couple tracer grooves in and I make some reduction in the area that I want to sub-opaque. Apply my bonding agent, apply my opaquers, then obviously you got to try your restoration to make sure it still seats properly. But I create the room, I cure the opaquer in, uh, before I cement the re restoration, so nothing's going to squeeze. Because if you just try to put it in and squeeze, it goes all over the place. That, that technique is not very, uh, not very effective. Effective in rare occasions, but it's not really that controllable. So I cure it first. Well, I, I think I'll mention something, and Jim, you may want to follow up. You may know more than I on this. But for these clinical classifications were determined before the etiology is determined. And from my understanding, DD1, so you have uh, DI, and I don't make the distinctions DI2, DI3, because I think they're, they're all DSPP. Uh, and as you mentioned, DI type 1 is the collagen type mutations. But for dentin dysplasia type 1 and dentin dysplasia type 2, dentin dysplasia type 1 is due to DSPP type mutations. And dentin dysplasia type 1, as far as I know, I don't think the gene has been found, has it? And, and I think so, this isn't published, but we've done linkage for DD type 1, and it, it's not a DSPP mutation, so I think it's something else. And I know, I think it's with DD1, you have thistle shaped um, dentinal pulps, oftentimes. Is it two? Is it two? 
okay, thistle shape. So it's, it's to do with the, the clinical findings that were supposedly different between the clinical types of disease. Right. So, so uh, essentially inherited dentin defects are divided into two types of dentin dysplasia and three types of dentinogenesis imperfecta. And the, uh, the sort of the odd one out is dentin dysplasia type one. And this is a autosomal dominant condition. That I didn't really go into that in that we don't know the uh, genetic etiology, but we do know that it's not linked to DSPP. So it's a separate entity. And it has some uh, curious features. It, uh, it's autosomal dominant, and yet it only uh, occurs about one in every 100,000 people. And that usually a dominant condition is going to be much more prevalent than one in 100,000. So it probably has some type of unusual mutation that can create this particular phenotype. And it just simply hasn't been discovered yet. And it, it has uh, basically, this is the rootless teeth uh, appearance with the pulp chambers filled in. The histology of the pulpal areas show that uh, there's this cascading histology in the pulp region. And that's thought to be due to the odonoblasts dying and then being replaced over and over again to produce this kind of pathology in the pulp chamber. So there's, that's just sort of a separate curious entity right now, very rare, and uh, we, it's actually difficult to get enough patients to get the genetic power to determine what causes that. Now dentin dysplasia 2 is just a mild form of dentinogenesis imperfecta. It's just simply the defect doesn't cause such a uh, strong change in the tooth. And so people have called it thistle-shaped pulp chambers, but that's actually just because the pulp chambers are just closing in a little slower than in uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2 or type 3. And so that's thistle chamber is actually at the time that the teeth are erupting. But later on, they fill in just like the uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta. So the, that classification is, uh, I think that but most people just think of it now in terms of a, the etiology. So dentinogenesis, dentin dysplasia type 2, dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2 and type 3 are all just DSPP mutations that show that because of the difference in the, where the mutation is, there's just a somewhat difference in severity. I think that in, now that once we have the uh, ability to, it used to be that you had to like try to figure it out and then check a particular gene here or there to see what gene causes the disorder. But now it's getting so that the technology is such that we can sequence the whole exome and soon the whole genome at a reasonable price, like under $1,000, and then check out all the candidate genes that we have listed and come up with a diagnosis without having to figure it out beforehand. So I think that uh, these new genetic means and tests are going to allow us to be able to do that without having figured out much more than it's a genetic defect. Now to further elaborate by uh, focusing on the long-term prognosis of these dentin dysplasias, Dentin dysplasia type 1 is quite unique. Uh, these teeth with very short roots tend to be spontaneously abscessed very early on. So any type of definitive treatment is not going to last long. So that make that group of patients particularly unique. And when you devise a treatment plan, you need to consider uh, that the long-term prognosis for that condition is extremely poor. Dr. Crispin, I wanted to follow up on your sub-opig technique. And you did a try-in, and you weren't satisfied. Were you using a try-in paste or gel or something there? Uh, usually, I just use, on a single tooth like that, I, I just use water. Uh, if, I, if I have multiple units where I need a little more viscosity to hold them in, then I would, then I would use a try-in uh, gel or try-in paste. You could even use KY jelly, which is a little more viscous. I like to use clear. Uh, and then there's a material called clear veneer from pulp dent. It's the only veneer cement that I'm aware of that's actually clear. Mm -hmm. So if I try it with water, you know, this clear veneer cement is going to mimic it almost exactly. 
Okay, so what you're saying is that you actually use this uh, opaque material, placed it in there, put some water over it, and your light didn't cause it to adhere to the tooth. Well, what stage am I at? If I, if I, if I, from the very beginning, I just clean everything up, and uh, a single unit like that, I would try it in with some water just to see if it matches. Okay, if it doesn't match, then I know I have to do some modification. So depending upon how much modification I think I need, you know, I probably, in a case like this that was fairly dark, uh, you know, cut it back a little bit, apply my bonding agents, and the, uh, the opaquers are light cured, so those are bonded in, okay, and cured. And then I try in the veneer again, and uh, you just use either a try and gel or water. In this case, I used water. And it's just a trial and error process until you get the result, you know, that's acceptable. Actually, bonding the subopaker in for your triant. Correct. So that way, the, the other question is how do you keep it from oozing out? That's how you keep it oozing out. It's stable. Yeah. And that's why I bond it in because now you, what you see is what you get. It's not going to be moving. Because the other problem is, you know, rarely do try and uh, gel match the viscosity of the cement. And so, you, you know, you, you, you may think you got it down, but then you use a more viscous cement and it just squeezes everything out and you're, you're right back to where you started uh, by. by Cutting it back, sub opaquing, you got complete stability and predictability. Great. Well, in the interest of time, we will. Oh, I'm sorry. One last question then. Um, I guess I'd like to just try to tie things together a little bit because I've always felt very challenged in treating these patients because I always wondered at what point was the deformation of enamel or dentin or bone going to affect the way materials normally work. Um, I worry about the, all the materials that require bonding. Does it really bond to the dentin in dentinogenesis imperfecta patients? Does the collagen change affect the way you bond to it? Do you not bond these patients? The osteogenic components, do those folks accept implants? Do the implants integrate properly? When you can't restore a tooth, will an implant work? Um, I really don't see a lot in the literature about how the materials that we work with normally work on these patients. And it always makes me very nervous when I start doing big reconstructive cases. I, I tend to be afraid of bonding them. I tend to go back to normal cement and just pray that the structure is going to be strong enough to hold it because I don't trust the bond to work. Am I wrong in that? Um, can we tie the restorative to the deficiency of the structure that is found in these patients? You're not incorrect. Uh, it is, in the literature, uh, the available information is very limited. And also, uh, because of uh, the limited availability of these T's for in vitro testing, there's really not a whole lot of information that's being made available. Um, some of the early um, literature using the primary T's affected with aminogenesis imperfecta uh, did present some evidence that for the AI with hypomaturation type, where there's significant organic material uh, remain in the enamel layer, those enamel can be better um, treated with a little bit of um, sodium hypochlorite prior to the uh, regular etching procedure. And that would increase the um, uh, creation of the me mechanical uh, retention for those surface. But other than that, there's very limited information. Uh, we can deduce from what we understand in terms of structural uh, defect among these patients, specifically with the denting um, defect patients, uh, their collagen may not be affected, but typically the minerals uh, that are surrounding the collagen that gives the strength to dentin is definitely going to be affected. And therefore, um, you can probably safely deduce that the bonding is not going to work the same for for that type of dentin compared to normal dentin. And theoretically, uh, all the genes that's being found responsible for enamel 
or denting defect at this time, isolated enamel or denting defect, they um, have not been demonstrated to have effect on bone. So uh, in terms of bone structure, the general growth of the alveolar dimensions, uh, we don't expect them to be uh, very different from the general population. Let me just address that from a clinical point of view, because I'm more of a, a, cl a clinical dentist. I think the thing you got to ask yourself is, you know, if someone has teeth that need to be restored, you know, what are your options? You know, I mean, certainly doing nothing is an option, but if something has to be done and there's a lot of unanswered questions, you know, there are ways to at least create a hypothesis for a solution and then, you know, work your way through what, whether or not it's going to work. It may be uh, provisional bonding. Uh, before you jump into a more expensive uh, adhesive ceramic restorations. Uh, you can do, I mean, I show techniques where we do full mouth matrix bonding, where we bond it in and, uh, you know, and, and test whether or not it's going to be aesthetic and function and maybe be adhesive. Uh, you can even get indirect provisional materials that are less expensive, at least for a, for a fairly extended period of time to see if it's going to work. I mean, there's you know, the, the, the bottom line is if you have to do something, you have to walk your way through a, a treatment. You know, and if the patient, you know, has the resources to invest in final restorations and it's not a big deal if it doesn't, doesn't work, you know, last an extremely long period of time, that may be the answer, but oftentimes that's not the case. And so you have to walk your way through kind of uh, uh, procedures that you can test your hypothesis. And there's ways to do it in most instances. Sounds like we're all going to take a stab at this. I think that's a great question. Sounds like a good good idea for a grant, if you ask me, but I, I think between animal models recapitulating some of these defects and, you know, a lot of these, uh, in a number of conditions, genetic conditions, they form family groups and they get together and interact with scientists of various types that really help move forward understanding of their particular disease. But I think there is a real need, uh, it, it sounds like it would be a great project, to test different forms of, you say, bonding agents, treatments for specific types of defects to see which are optimal. Yeah, I'd pretty much like to agree with what people are saying. I'd, that we're not going to have data in papers telling us what's going to be, what will work for your patient. Essentially, especially with the enamel defects, there, there's a lot of different genetic causes. and. Any literature on, say, uh, hypomaturation forms don't seem to bond as well. There's, there's ki that kind of thing, but whenever you look at them, it's like, what was the actual case that you were bonding to? Was this an amelogenin or some other gene that was defective? So in order to get a literature that will provide information for dentists, we first need to have people determine exactly what's the genetic cause and then report whether or not bonding, for instance, was a, a successful technique. And, and so I, I think I uh, would approach it like Bruce uh, was telling us that we should do a little experiment, try putting some bonding on a, a tooth here or there and see if it holds up. And, and, and pretty much that'll be the best information you can get. But there's also a challenge for people in dentistry if they, as we are able to make genetic diagnoses, then there's uh, potential to make short reports that show how it was restored and if that type of conservative treatments of bonding were successful. Great. Thank you very much for the great questions. And I'd like to encourage that there will be continuous exchange out in the lobby. Uh, there's a reception for everyone. Thank you.